Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Hi, this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio here with James Jacob Prash, live via Skype in England. Uh, Jacob, uh, let's talk about J.D. Farrakh and commentary on his positions and how they could perhaps lead others astray. You raise a difficult subject, and I know a number of our viewers have been concerned about him for some time. J.D. Farrakh is an Arab-American believer. His parents, to my understanding, fled Egypt from Islamic persecution, perhaps in the Nasser era, I'm not sure. His family may be Coptic. They may be from a Coptic Christian background. They may be, I don't know. If they are pure Arab or if they are Coptic, I don't know. He's obviously not a Nubian, but he could be of Coptic background. I once led a Coptic guy named George Antaki to the Lord in Cairo, and although the Coptic Church, being very ancient, is not in any biblical sense evangelical, and they're into the icons and so forth, I have met people within it that I'm sure are personally believers, are personally saved Christians. So first of all, he's a Calvary Chapel pastor, now in Hawaii, based in Hawaii, who does regular weekly prophetic updates. <clears throat> but both his family and my family are from the Middle East. My family, of course, is Israeli. And he and myself have very, very similar views. In fact, we have identical views on the political significance of contemporary events in the Middle East and, and related political issues. He would be, broadly speaking, in a camp with uh, Amir Zafardi, whom I, whom I like, and uh, he, he and I would say the same kinds of things about Barack Obama, about the present American Trump administration, about events in the Middle East, and the, the prophetic ramifications of what's transpiring on a global stage. We agree on those things. He and I also <clears throat> are both admirers of our late brother Chuck Smith, whom I like very much personally, and who I generally agreed with. A few points maybe I didn't, but I generally agreed with Chuck and liked him. And I was appalled that some Calvary chapels have turned away from Chuck and even turned against him when he was old and sick and after he went to be with the Lord, Brian Broderson began, of course, attacking Chuck's doctrinal positions on prophecy and eschatology on the airwaves. As I've warned many times, Brian Broderson would hijack Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa and take it away from the legacy of Chuck Smith, and that is exactly what happened. To his credit, to his credit, J.D. Farrig joined with Jack Hibbs and with Joe Foch and with certain other people in Calvary Chapel, Pastor Marco Quintana, these are good men. Uh, some of them are very good men. And they opposed what Brian Broderson did and took something of a stand. I agree with those things. There's so much I agree with J.D. Farrakh. Not least of all, however, both he and I firmly believe in the doctrine of the rapture. We have to understand something, that belief in a rapture is dissipating in certain quarters. There are even people making fun of it, particularly certain elements of the New Apostolic Reformation and people who've gone into Dominion theology and uh, who've gone into neo-constructionism and things of this nature. They're denying the rapture and some even mocking it. Uh, Mike Bickle says that the rapture of Elijah was God's judgment on Elijah. <clears throat> A figure in England, Gerald Coates, said it's a fantasy and a myth. Gerald Coates is a proven false prophet uh, for other reasons. Um, Rick Joyner has said it's of the devil. Um, the rapture is under attack as a belief. And rapture believers, no matter 
what their position on the timing of the rapture, I've always felt, need to stand together in the face <clears throat> of rapture denial and oppose it. Um, I've said many times what Rick Warren is doing is directly of the devil. Rick Warren's teaching, public teaching, that we should avoid end-time prophecy as a diversion when Jesus reiterated, reiterated in the Olivet Discourse, be alert, watch for these things, the purpose-driven agenda of, of Rick Warren is teaching the diametric opposite. You have people like Rick Joyner and, and others, Gerald Coates in England, teaching against what the scripture says about the rapture, as did Mike Bickle. It's very dangerous. These things, I believe, are an assault on the doctrine of the rapture that comes from the devil. And many Christians are being seduced, and those who believe in the rapture need to stand together <coughs> and oppose those who deny it. The question becomes the timing of the rapture. I accept, and I have always accepted, that among my fellow rapture believers, there is a diverse array of opinion as to the timing. A diverse array of opinion. Charles Spurgeon, A.W. Tozer, Dr. Walter Martin, author of Kingdom of the Cults, etc., and Corey Tenboom, among other luminaries. People who God raised up, people whom God used, did not believe in pre tribulationism. I do not believe the rapture can happen until the faithful church know who the Antichrist is. Now, that is a view. I realize there are pre-tribulational people who disagree with Charles Spurgeon, with Corey Ten Boom, with A.W. Tozer. They disagree with Dr. Walter Martin. They disagree with myself, a much lesser luminary. They disagree. We all believe the rapture, but we do not have the same view as to its timing. This idea, or this aspect of the rapture, its timing, where it occurs in the spectrum or the timeline of prophetic events eschatologically is a very important issue. It's an important issue. It warrants prayerful dialogue, serious discussion. It warrants academic forums, scholarly symposiums, even debates among brothers who believe in it. Dallas professors from Dallas Seminary promoting a pre-tribulational view who are in line with the views of the late Dr. John Wolford. Uh, those who take a different view. Um, certainly Marvin Rosenthal, myself, various others. Those who agree with, with Dr. Walter Martin with A.W. Tozer, with Charles Spurgeon, with Corey Denboom. We need to come together. It's a matter for discussion, not for division. The opponent are those who are denying the rapture, those who are Satan manipulated into pointing people away from looking to the return of Jesus. That's the opposition. Those who believe it should not be divided themselves. We need to come together. If we can't find the consensus, we should at least agree we're on the same team. We need to discuss this. We need to explore this in a spirit of Christian fellowship, not divide over it. But in the last three years or so, something very unfortunate has happened within the pre-tribulational camp. Contemporary pre-tribulationism is not traditional pre-tribulationism. Traditional pre-tribulationism quite simply was, I wish we'd all been ready, don't miss it. There is a newfangled pre-tribulationism or different versions of that that are saying all kinds of things that traditional pre-tribulation advocates never ever stated, taught, or believed. To begin with, I wish we'd all been ready. We're told 
after the rapture, men still did not be part of their wicked deeds. What's happening here? Now there's people saying it's going to herald the great end time revival after the rapture. If you can't get saved before the rapture, getting saved after the rapture will be an automatic death sentence if it's possible at all. Most of what the scripture says, most of what the scripture says emphatically is that once the faithful church has been removed, God turns his purposes back to dealing with Israel and the Jews. This new kind of pre-tribulationism is not, I wish we'd all been ready. It's not what my traditional pre-trib friends always believed in hell to. Right or wrong, they didn't believe what's being stated now. Things that came out from Tim LaHaye. Now, I liked Tim LaHaye personally. He was a friend of mine. I did conferences with him. He was not a bad man, and he was well-intentioned. But he was not theologically <clears throat> well-grounded in Scripture in any kind of a scholarly sense, certainly. And he would come out with some really, really wild propositions. Don't worry about the Antichrist. Now, Jesus was emphatic. Watch out for the Antichrist. Watch out for the anti there will be many Antichrists. I hate to state this again, but Tim LaHaye publicly called for 300 major evangelical leaders to volunteer to go to federal prison in solidarity with Sun Young Moon, the Korean Antichrist and cult leader, a self-confessed Antichrist. In his book, The Divine Principle, he stated he was the Lord of the Second Advent, that Jesus Christ failed, he came to succeed where Jesus did not. And he stated his wife was the Holy Spirit. This was a self-confessed Antichrist. And Tim LaHaye publicly supported him and said Christians should go to prison in solidarity with him when he was indicted and then convicted for fraud and other things. I know people who were saved out of his unification church cult. It's a demonic, demonic entity based on idolatry. Yet Tim LaHaye went with this. When that same moon gave a couple of million dollars to Liberty University, to Jerry Falwell, Jerry Falwell publicly embraced this Antichrist and called him, quote-unquote, an unsung hero. Jerry Falwell embraced an Antichrist. And Liberty professors who are pre-trib proponents, like Ed Hinson, sat there and did not utter a word of protest. But that's only the beginning. These Antichrists. Now they've gone into another realm of open, open abrogation of what the Word of God teaches. You have people who are standing with John MacArthur. I mean major pre-trib figures, such as Dr. Phil Johnson, and some lesser ones, like uh, Jimmy DeYoung. John MacArthur teaches in direct rejection of the book of Revelation that it will be possible for people, it will be possible for people to worship the Antichrist, take the mark of the beast, worship his image, and still be saved and go to heaven. That's what he's saying. And he says it on YouTube. Watch it. Story to tell. Yeah, absolutely. Top of it. Uh, I've got a surprise for you today. Okay. Do you remember when you talked about the, uh, someone asked uh, about the mark of the beast and whether or not someone could receive the mark of the beast and then become a believer? You remember that? Uh-huh. Do you remember the controversy that stirred up? Yes. It was quite a bit, wasn't it? It was. I got a lot of emails, people saying, I can't believe he would say such a thing. You remember all that? Yes, sir, I do. All right. Well, I was walking April the other night listening to a Q&A uh, from a few years ago. Uh, where Pete, John MacArthur on a Wednesday night lets, ha, would have the folks in his congregation stand up and go to the microphone and shoot questions at him. Would you like to hear the question he was asked and his answer? <laughs> yeah. Okay, here we go. In regard to the latter half of the tribulation period, when, when men would be required to 
have the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell. My question is, uh, once a person takes the mark, is there any possibility of him coming to Christ? Yes. Uh, I think, you know, in, in the seven-year tribulation coming in the future, we're going to get into this so probably a week from Sunday night, maybe this Sunday night, maybe a week, I'm not sure. But um, the tribulation is a seven-year period, right? The rapture of the church, seven-year tribulation, then Christ returns, sets up his kingdom. Now, in that seven-year period, really two things happen. God begins to judge the world in, with a series of holocausts, and at the same time, he begins to redeem his people Israel. And in the process of this, the Antichrist establishes his rule, and in order to function in the economy of the Antichrist, you have to take the mark of the beast. Uh, the mark being the number of a man, Revelation 13, 666. Six is the number of man, right? Seven is the number of perfection, and man always falls short of perfection. Six, 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 six. Always six is never seven. So the number of man. And apparently what's going to happen, you take the mark on your hand or on your forehead. And we've talked a lot about that, you know, that, uh, that that's kind of the computer situation. We're now moving fast toward the time when we're going to have to do everything we do by cards and by numbers and all of that. And uh, uh, those numbers, the thing about a card that's a problem is you lose it, and they've already devised systems to put the number on your hand and on your forehead, and you go through a scanner, and, you know, that's how you buy and sell. It's automatically deducted from your bank account. Now, the question is, if you're living in the tribulation period, and you take this mark, in other words, you identify with the beast's empire, will you still be able to be redeemed? And I think the answer to that is yes. Yes. Otherwise, there would be no salvation of anybody in the end of the tribulation. Yeah. And you've got to have the salvation of folks in the end of the tribulation. You're going to have the Jews redeemed. You're going to have, according to Revelation chapter 7, an innumerable number of Gentiles redeemed, so many they can't even be counted across the face of the earth. So I don't think the fact that someone takes that is a sentence to, it, to permanency any more than you being a part of this world system once in your life means you have to be a part of the system all your life. Well, especially when the 144,000 don't start their ministry till the second half. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That make it a little tough. Yeah. Well, there you go, Dr. DeYoung. <laughs> well, we're looking at the same book. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what's so interesting, and that's what we were saying. I mean, you know, that's not the impartable sin. You've got to be... I, the thought, I, I've never thought that what he said there was very interesting. The fact is, if nobody gets saved in the last three and a half years because they have received that mark, where's that uh, unbelievable number of Jews that come to know Christ and that are living that actually go into the millennial kingdom in natural bodies? That's good that uh, Brother John is looking at the same book that I am, and we came up with the same answers. Well, it is, and that was very interesting because you remember that was really, really controversial. I don't, I'm not so sure you've ever made a statement on our program before that was as controversial as that one. And I got so many emails on it, and uh, and then I was walking the dog the other night listening to this Q and A, and I thought, oh, I've got to play this on the air. This this will be a great surprise for Doctor DeYoung. So there well, you go. it is a pleasant surprise, and uh, the dear brothers and sisters who disagreed, you know, I don't quite know where they were coming from. I, I don't need to know that. But just uh, now, with uh, that confirmation from another uh, Bible teacher, and he's a great Bible teacher. I'm just a beginner, but uh, no, the, I wouldn't the, say that. But, go but on. <laughs> uh, it's great to see that, and the confirmation of both of us believing that same thing. I wonder how many more emails you're going to get now. <laughs> oh well, oh well. You got two guys on your side that are pretty good, right? <laughs> I think so too. I think so too. I yeah. do. Well, we uh, both love you and love what you're doing and have the opportunity to interact on your program. Well, the feeling's mutual. Thank you. Let's... <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. Well, in Revelation chapter 14, we read the following. <clears throat> Verse 11. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And now it doesn't sound like annihilationism. And whoever receives the mark of his name. Now John MacArthur openly and publicly rejects that and says it will be possible to worship the Antichrist, to worship an incarnation of Satan in de facto terms, to sell your soul to the devil, to take the mark of the beast, worship his image, and still go to heaven. And you've got people like Phil Johnson and Jimmy DeYoung agreeing with him and defending him. This is not traditional pre-tribulationism. This caving in on the Antichrist that Tim LaHaye did, that Ed Hinton went along with, that Jerry Falwell did, that John McCarthy goes even further, supported by 
others like Phil Johnson. This is dangerous. This is not traditional pre-tribulationism. There'll be a great revival after the rapture. This is not traditional pre-tribulationism. Don't worry about the Antichrist. Embrace him. Go to prison with him in, solidar in solidarity. This is not traditional pre-tribulationism. An Antichrist is not an unsung hero. You cannot worship the Antichrist. Sell your soul to the devil. Take the mark of the beast. Worship his image and have salvation. The smoke goes up forever and ever. Then we have another major pre-tribulation leader, Dr. David Reagan. He's an annihilationist. He says, no, that can't be true. There is no eternal judgment. They are annihilated. Now, it's annihilationist. You have annihilationist pre-tribulationist. Now, notice these are not fringe elements. These are not peripheral figures. When you talk about David Reagan and John MacArthur, when you talk about the late Jerry Falwell and Tim LaHaye, you are talking about major leaders, major leaders of pre-tribulationism. Traditional pre-tribulationism is a minority view within the pre-trib camp now. They're a house very much divided. Traditional pre-tribulationism had its academic patriarch, and the late Dr. John Wolverd, president of Dallas Seminary, who wrote a book on the rapture. In his book, Dr. Wolverd admits, admits that exegetically, there is no passage in scripture, no passage in scripture that teaches a pre-trib rapture. It is a view, an opinion, a position that is gleaned from an overview of what scripture says on the subject of the rapture and of eschatology broadly speaking, but there's no passage that teaches it. That is traditional pre-tribulationism, at least the scholarly school of it. Without going into the issues of Mr. Schofield or Mr. Darby, just taking a purely mid to late 20th century and early 21st century view of pre-tribulationism, what you see today is not traditional. And the people deviating from it are not peripheral figures. They're central players, major evangelical leaders. In his book on the rapture, Dr. Wolverd was clear. There's no passage that teaches it. But today we have people saying, that there is. Again, this came from Tim LaHaye's camp. Tim LaHaye was followed by Thomas Ice. Now, we have to understand something about Thomas Ice, and I don't say this in a vindictive way. He agreed to debate me, and he agreed to debate Joe Schimmel, and then he backed down from the debates after agreeing to do them. Thomas Ice, as an academic, well, he's done some good things. He wrote an excellent book with Wayne House refuting Dominion theology. There's no question he's done some good things. But his exegesis can be quite appalling. He is not Dr. Thomas Ice. He has a non-accredited doctorate, a phony doctorate. James White has two phony doctorates. This is dishonest. This is a misrepresentation. These men are not serious PhD level scholars. Their doctorates are phony. They're not accredited. That's not good. They've proposed a position that is Thomas Ice and Tim Lay have proposed a position that the term apostasia from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 means departure. It means the rapture. It does not mean a great falling away from the faith. 
When Thomas Ice proposed this at the pre-trib conference in Dallas among pre-trib leaders, a real pre-trib scholar with a real doctorate, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, who is a successful lawyer but also a Dallas-educated theologian, a man whom I like personally and respect very much, he beautifully, beautifully defeated Hank Hanegraaff on the issue of hyperpreterism and the authorship and date of the book of Revelation in a debate, Dr. Mark Hitchcock is the best debater the pre-trib camp have on an academic level. He's a man who's entitled to respect and recognition. He's a man I take seriously. And again, he's a good, he's a good guy. Not an arrogant guy, but a smart guy, very smart, and a very good debater. Mark Hitchcock challenged this at their conference, saying if 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 was what you say, the term would be harpezo. It would not be apostasia. He went against Thomas Ice in defense of the traditional pre-trib relational view. Another serious pre-trib figure who I like very much and have always liked, he's a friend of mine, I agree with him on most things, <laughs> apart from the timing of the rapture, is Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Arnold is a serious guy following Dr. Charles Ryrie's school of thought out, out of Dallas Seminary with an emphasis on the Judeo-Christian theology of the first century church and the relationship between Second Temple period Judaism and the Sitzim Leben of the Gospels in the Second Temple period and the Gospels themselves, uh, <clears throat> the relationship with Judaism as it was then. Arnold is a serious author. He's written at least two books that I consider to be superbly well, well authored. Arnold takes the position that the Great Tribulation will not happen until the Antichrist is revealed. Now he says this may be before the rapture or it may be after the rapture, but the Great Tribulation will not commence until the Antichrist is revealed. Again, that is nothing like what's being taught today by those who've departed from traditional pre-tribulations. It appears to me, as somebody who is not pre-tribulational, that those who are upholding traditional pre-tribulational eschatology, such as Dr. Arnold Fuchtenbaum and such as Dr. Mark Hitchcock, are the more scholarly element, the more theologically trained element, are upholding traditional pre-tribulationism. Without wanting to be offensive, it is the less educated and the less exegetically skilled and the less knowledgeable who are deviating from it. Again, I have no argument with traditional pre-tribulationism in the sense that I see it as a position that although not the same as my own, is something that is not in any sense heretical, and it is something that we can discuss and that we can come to some kind of an understanding of, of why we differ and seek the Lord to show us and learn from each other. I have no problem. I can dialogue with those people. I can fellowship with those people. I can discuss this with these people. No problem. But that's traditional pre-tribulationism. What Thomas Ice has come out with, what Tim LaHaye came out with, what John MacArthur has come out with, what David Reagan has come out with, what Jerry Falwell came out with, what people like Ed Hinson have gone along with, is not traditional pre-tribulationism. They're divided against themselves. Now going back to J.D. Farrick, he has recently bought in 
to the position of Thomas Ice that the rapture is the apostasy, that the apostasy is the rapture. I'm not trying to be offensive. Again, I emphasize so much of what J.D. Farrick says, I agree with. Events in the Middle East, a perspective of contemporary political events in light of end time prophecy, his support of the traditional views of Chuck Smith within Calvary Chapel and his opposition to the departure from it by Brian Broderson. He has said a lot of good things and because both of our families come from the Middle East and because of our own work with the persecuted church, his family being from a persecuted background, it is very difficult for me to be critical of a brother like this. I do not deny his good intentions and I do not want to sound like I am in any way attacking him personally. I too follow, I, I met uh, Amir Safari in Israel, I too follow him. I uh, follow his, his, his news reports and things like this. There's so much in common. But when you say the apostasy is the rapture, and the rapture is the apostasy, and you give a proposition based on manuscript history that not until the 1611 edition of King James was the term translated as a falling away, but always as a departure. Now we have an issue. Again, I do not want to offend. I'm not the most learned man in the world. My credentials are on the internet. I went to Hebrew University. I speak Hebrew. My Arabic is not fluent, but I'm told by my Arab friends it's not bad. Uh, the language of Mr. Farid's family. Alhamdulillah. Shukran. I learned to read Latin as a kid. I learned to read Latin and liturgical Latin as a little boy. Sushipia Dominus Sacrificium, De Manibus Tui, At Laudum et Gloriam Nobilis Sui, Ad Utilitatem Quoque Nostrum, Tusiusque Ecclesiae Suis Sante. And of course, in Bible College, London School of Theology Seminary, and Cambridge University, I had to know Greek and some theological German. But I'm no genius. I don't claim to be a genius. I don't claim to be anything but a sinner saved by grace. But I do know that I've learned biblical languages. And I do know that I was taught by the best manuscript history. I'd like to read, please, concerning Mr. Farrick's recent statements, something from the epistle of Second Peter chapter 3. Peter says this in 2 Peter chapter 3, and he's writing again in an eschatological context. In verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, he's speaking about the return of Jesus. In verse 14, he says, Therefore, because of this, beloved, since you took, look, look for these things, the return of Christ, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Walk with the Lord faithfully, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things. at the humility displayed by Peter. Now God blessed Peter, God used Peter. Peter said and wrote many important things that are canonical, directly under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There's no question God used him. There's no question that God has used J.P. Farrick in certain respects. I don't question that. But Paul was a rabbi. He was trained in the school of well, by Rabbi Gamaliel. 
He was a Greco-Roman intellectual that even the pagans realized his great learning. Now that did not equip him for the ministry. He had to take those things to the cross before God used them. But God saves all of us and he redeems our human background. Peter says, according to the wisdom that Paul has, it was Paul who appeared before the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers and the Areopagites in Athens. It was Paul who argued with the Sanhedrin and appeared before Caesar. Paul had the background. He had not only the right passport as a Roman citizen, but the formal education that even the Greeks and Romans recognized, as well as his fellow rabbis. In the book of Acts, in the New Testament, we see something. The second generation of leaders who God raised up after the initial apostles, Paul, Barnabas, Apollos, were more educated than the first. I'm sorry to say that by and large, one of the things that went wrong in Calvary Chapel is this. The second generation of leaders were not as learned as people like Paul Smith or even as Chuck. They were not as learned. Uh, it was always milk, not enough meat. Now milk is fine for young believers, but there was not many people in Calvary Chapel who could teach meat. The second generation did not know more than the previous one. Well, in the book of Acts, we see that there was an upward mobility. This is not to lift up education and esteem it in a way that we should idolize it. But it is to say that Jesus said, I will send you philosophers or prophets and scribes. I'll send you sofrim. I'll send you experts in the text, some of whom you will persecute and kill. Jesus did say when a scribe, an academic theologian of the day, an expert in the text, the Sofrim, they came from the Hebrew Lispor, they counted the letters of, uh, of every manuscript. Textual experts, when a scribe becomes a disciple, he brings out of the treasury things old and things new. Paul had that. Peter said, let Paul explain the complicated things. Because those who are untaught will distort them. With J.D. Farrig, we have a case where someone who is untaught is distorting the scripture in saying that the apostasy is the rapture. Again, I'm not lifting up myself because of my education. I was a cocaine addict in New York before Jesus got a hold of me. Who am I to lift up anything but him? But the Lord did allow me to get a formal education in science and in theology. And I went to some of the top institutions in the world. Um, but that was just God. I'm not boasting about anything but Jesus. But with respect, and I, I don't demean Peter because I recognize the grace of God in Paul. Well, I don't demean Pastor Farag, because I recognize the grace of God in more formally qualified pre-trib leaders such as Dr. Mark Hitchcock or Arnold Fuchtenbaum. I'm not trying to demean the man or belittle him. But it is obvious he does not have the background in the Greek language or the relationship between Hebrew and Greek via the Septuagint, or the knowledge of manuscript history that he seems to imply or represents or misrepresents himself as having given his statements on the translation of apostasia and the manuscript history of the King James. I don't believe he has that level of formal qualification. He's out of his league. Unlike Peter, who left such things to Paul, he's overstepped his bounds. And he's distorting the Word of God on this point. I say this as graciously as I can. I'm not trying to attack him or his motives. I have no doubt he's a brother. I have no doubt he means well. But he doesn't know what he's talking about. The term 
apostasia in Greek. The prefix apo, outside of, outside stance is basically what it means. An outside stance. Now his claim was, prior to the King James Bible, which he sees as erroneous on this point, it was never translated that, it was always translated departure. Prior to the Reformation, prior to the translation spurned by Erasmus's New Testament, which was the Texas Receptus, a fusion of four earlier Byzantine manuscripts from the majority text that spurned the New Testament translations of William Tyndale and Martin Luther into German, and Tyndale into English, prior to Mr. Coverdale, Prior to the Reformation, you had three essential Bibles in the Christian world. Three, only three, three main ones. First of all, you had the Latin Vulgate, the Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. However, it was also John Calvin's translation of choice. Calvin followed the Vulgate almost exclusively. He followed the same Bible as the Roman Church, the Vulgate of Jerome. Well, if you look in the Vulgate, you will see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the word apostasia is translated into Latin, decesio, decesio, meaning revolt. There will be a revolt against God in the last days. Decesio, a revolt against the Word of God in the last days, that was the Vulgate. It was the Roman Catholic translation and it was the Calvinistic translation of Calvin. Decesio. In the Eastern Byzantine world, what was left of it after the Islamic conquest and so forth, the Bible remained the Greek texts. They had majority texts. They didn't have the Texas Receptus, obviously. And the Bible of the, the Eastern Orthodox Church to this day for the Old Testament remains the Septuagint to this day. They had the Greek. The only English Bible of any note prior to the works of people like Tyndale and Coverdale was John Wycliffe's Bible. Not easy to read, unless you have a degree in English literature. But you can read it somewhat. John Wycliffe helped spawn the Reformation way before the Reformation. It was him who inspired the Bohemian Brethren and John Hus, who taught the Gospel and attempted a Reformation in Bohemia a hundred years before Luther. But it began with John Wycliffe in England, the morning star of the Reformation, and his father was the low lords. In the Wycliffe Bible, the word is translated not departure. It's translated dissension. Dissension. Dissension in Greek is dikostasias. We get the word dichotomy basically. Dikostasias, a fork in the road. You can continue on the way you've been on, where you can divert onto this other way, a decostasia. This term is very much the same as apostasia. It's only the prefix that's different. Apostasia or decostasia. Stasia is the same. The root word is the same. Where do you stand? Do you divert or do you go outside of? That's it. Apostasia, go outside of it, or just, or or as they translated it, divert, as as Wycliffe translated it. Why this term? Let's look at the thinking prior to the King James, Romans chapter sixteen, verse seventeen. I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. 
there will be people who will teach things contrary to the doctrine of the apostles, who will scandalize, what we translate hindrances is scandalizos, scandalize, and cause dicostasia, dissension. No place, no place was that word ever translated as departure. No place was it ever translated as rapture. No place before the Reformation or before the King James did it mean in anyone's thinking what J.D. Farrick says it means. That's simply not the manuscript history. That's not what Wycliffe did. It's certainly not what the Vulgate did. Those are the scriptures that were available. That was not their thinking. It was not their thinking at all. The King James did not get it wrong. In this instance, the King James got it right. I really do not want to belittle J.D. Farrig. But Peter said, leave these complex issues to those who have the wisdom to deal with it. I don't think he would even pretend in a serious debate to have the wisdom to deal with manuscript history or with Greek etymology. Let's deal with the Greek etymology. The argument becomes for people like Thomas Ice, not that apostasia means rapture itself, but an underlying Greek term, apostiamai, apostiamai, to go out of. So he's taking an underlying term, not the term in the text, but an underlying term, and making that the basis of the translation by which he arrives at the idea it's a departure, therefore it's the rapture. Remember, traditional pre-trib people do not believe this. Dr. Wolverd did not believe this. Mark Hitchcock does not believe this. The pre-trib academics, traditional pre-trib, do not believe it. It's not an orthodox position. It's a newfangled heterodox proposition. Now let's understand something. To those who know Greek and who went to Bible college or seminary and who've been trained in Greek, they will understand the real issue concerning 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and the use of the term apostasia is if or not it is hapex legemini. If or not it is Hapex legemini, a term that only occurs one place per se in Scripture. And to understand its meaning in the context, we have to look at the context, but also the definition of the word in light of what may be found in the Septuagint or may be found in the classical Greek literature, because there is no precedent for it to be used elsewhere in Scripture. Is it Hapex legemini? Most conservative evangelical scholars, strictly speaking, say it is not. In fact, the majority would say it is plainly not, and I would have to agree with them. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul is also writing about the last days. He's writing eschatologically. But the Spirit explicitly says, explicitly, it's something emphatic here, the Holy Spirit is speaking, in the latter times... Some will fall away from the faith, apostatize. In a parallel passage where Paul is speaking about the last days and a great falling away, he says it means apostatize, fall away. And in the broad context of Second Thelonians, they didn't love a knowledge of the truth. Therefore, the Lord will send the delusion upon them. It fits like a glove, fall away. When Mr. Farrah got this, I suppose possibly from Thomas Ice, who has a fake PhD, but it's something that traditional pre-trib, again, never believed. 
If you want to listen to pre-trip scholars, read Mark Hitchcock, read Arnold Fruchtenbaum, read Dr. Wolverine, but don't read people who don't know what they're talking about. Or people who pretend to know things that quite obviously really don't. And I'm not trying to offend, but I have to react to what they say, what they said publicly. Let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be drawn more strictly than the rest. Brother Farag and myself, when we stand before Jesus, he's going to hold us more accountable than he does others. And if there's error in what we say, we are going to be liable for misleading his people. It is something that is very serious. But then he goes on to say something else. He goes down a road taken by Paul Wilkinson in England. Paul Wilkinson had a doctorate in the eschatology of John Darby, not in theology, but in church history. And <clears throat> there are things about John Darby that Paul Wilkinson does not wish to defend in a debate. The fact that he was a hyper-dispensationalist among them. But let's leave Darby out of the equation as a factor for the moment. What Paul Wilkinson said, and what others, a few others have said, and now what J.D. Farrick has bought into is those not teaching pre-trib are false teachers. A.W. Tozer was a false teacher. Dr. Walter Martin, the apologist of that era who God raised up and thank God that he did raise him up, was a false teacher. Corey Ten Boom was a false teacher. Charles Spurgeon was a false teacher. No, Brother Thyroid, they were not. But by you saying the apostasy, the falling away is the rapture, you are teaching something that is false. Corey Ten Boom was not a false teacher. A.W. Tozer was not a false teacher. Walter Martin, Charles Spurgeon, and many others were not false teachers. They just did not place the rapture at the same point in prophetic events as you do. That does not make them false teachers. It is a shame and a disgrace to slander the heritage, the reputation, the names of people like this with a blanket statement like you made. It's a shame, Mr. Farrick. What you did is a thing of injustice and shame. I'm sorry. But you need to apologize and retract it. You're misleading God's people. You should not speak of people like this that way just because they place the rapture at a different point than you do with a blanket statement saying that they're false teachers. These are your exact words. It is shame. There's no euphemism for what you said and what you did. I'm sorry. And you do not have that kind of level of academic knowledge of manuscript history or Greek etymology. I'm sorry, you don't. It's obvious to anybody who does that you don't. And I don't say that to belittle you. I don't want to be saying these things at all because I know you to be a good man with good intention and you've said many things that are exactly right that I can only agree with 110%. It bothers me to say this, especially in view of the fact that you are an Arab brother, a descendant of Abraham, like my own family. But then to go on to say, that you are not preparing God's people for anything but celebration. I need to be careful for security reasons, but the week before last, I was in Communist China. We work with the underground house churches and their pastors in China. And I was there. And I shouldn't be saying this. You've got to be very careful. However, the 
Chinese pastors who are persecuted, who are being persecuted even now, told me that before the Cultural Revolution of Mao, when all churches were closed down, when all religion was outlawed, when all pastors were round up, many of them killed or sent to camps where they died. A very, very dark time. That there was a tradition that came from Watchman Nee and others associated with him, like Stephen Kong and Dr. Joshua Chu, and Watchman Nee was one of the main ones, that went back to Hudson Taylor, the missionary who came from England. And they prepared the church in China that they were in, those churches. They were largely a brethren background, that a terrible persecution was going to come before Jesus returned that they need to prepare for this persecution. That they need to store up as much grain as they can ahead of time. They need to have the word of God in their head and in their heart and understand what was going to happen. And to know that many of them were going to be imprisoned and many killed. They were taught that ahead of time. Watchman Eve told them that. He wound up in prison himself. Well, you know, the demographic epicenter of biblical Christianity, of born-again Christianity, of scriptural evangelism, call it what you will, the true body of Christ, is not the United States. It's got to be China. There's so many Christians. Now they have a lot of problems, a lot of problems. A lack of qualified leadership, a lack of doctrinal knowledge, they have problems with persecution, some cases poverty, they have a lot of problems. But growth is not one of them. Evangelism, despite the loss, not one of them. That church that was prepared for the persecution ahead of time is the one that survived and reached critical mass. So that when China was forced for economic reasons to lift up the bamboo curtain and allow a degree of freedom to revive their economy, the church revived. It exploded. It exploded. A critical mass happened during that period of the Cultural Revolution in intense persecution by believers who were prepared for it by their leaders ahead of time. That's what happened in China. This is not second hand, this is first hand from Chinese pastors. I was just there the week before last. Traditional pre trib people always said it's going to become difficult before Jesus comes. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. When people hear you say something dangerous and irresponsible, Dangerous and irresponsible. I'm only preparing for celebration. People who said things like that in China before the Cultural Revolution saw their churches eradicated and destroyed. They don't exist. They did not prepare the people of God for what was coming. What you're saying is dangerous, Mr. Farrig, very dangerous. And the blanket statement you made about those who are not pre-trib, whose ranks include Tozer, Spurgeon, Corey Tenboom, Walter Martin, was again irresponsible and shameful. To represent yourself as having an expertise in manuscript history And ancient Greek is not even honest. Now, again, I'm not saying you're a charlatan or a fraud, but it wasn't honest. You're not in that league. I know people who are absolute experts 
who disagree with each other on, on certain points of translation. It's not as simple as you make it out to be. I don't even think you understand what it really is. I know from going to Hebrew to the Septuagint and how does the Septuagint handle the Hebrew and then it comes into the New Testament and how does that compare with the Dead Sea Scrolls? It's not that simple of a task. I'm sorry. I'm not saying this to hurt you or to hurt your ministry. But what you did was very, very wrong. What you're teaching is erroneous. What you said was irresponsible. And I'm not against you. I'm not against you. I'm not your enemy. So much of what you say is exactly in line with my own convictions. That's what makes it so hard to have to respond to these things. But you've said it publicly and people are noticing and they're coming to us. I would like to say one more thing. Jan Markell in her radio broadcast that you talk about has done much good over a number of years. She's done much good Neither am I her enemy. But sometimes people who you like can be their own enemy, and that goes for all of us, self-included. There seems to be a lack of logic, or a contradictory logic, in what goes on with those conferences and broadcasts. I like Jonathan Kahn very much personally. He's a good guy. My sister danced at his wedding. I like him. And I agree that America did not learn the events of September 11th and what God was trying to say through them. David Wilkinson had a similar view, saying that America didn't learn. Jonathan Kahn is completely right. The theme of his books, I agree with him. And I like the guy. But I don't agree with his hermeneutics. Dan Markell, moreover, has always opposed money preachers and con artists and false prophets like Jim Baker and Kenneth Copeland. Now Jonathan Kahn is involved with those people and she's promoted him, but she won't say anything about where he's ventured. And again, I don't dislike the guy and I'm not discounting the valid things he says. But people get two different messages. Now they're getting two different messages about you. She features J.D. Farrag as a keynote conference speaker, promoting him and his ministry on a radio broadcast. After a lifetime of warning about the great apostasy, She's now promoting somebody who says the apostasy is the rapture. This is logically contradictory. Which is it? It confuses people. You're sending out two different messages. Where do you stand? Are you promoting somebody who says the apostasy is the rapture? Or are you saying that the apostasy is a falling away? Jan Markell, you can't have it both ways. You can't speak out of both sides of your mouth. And I say that with respect, not with animosity or contempt. You're a good woman with good intentions who's done many good things. And again, I am not against you. But what you're doing is detrimental to your own ministry. You can't say two different things at the same time. You can't promote two different messages at the same time. You're a discernment ministry. Where do you stand? Discernment is not ambiguous. Discernment is emphatic. It's clear cut. It's cut and dry. This is right. This is wrong. This is scriptural. This is not scriptural. 
Are you still warning about the apostasy as a falling away, or are you agreeing that the apostasy is the rapture with your keynote speaker? Which is it, John? I'm asking an honest, sincere question. You like Jonathan Kahn, I like Jonathan Kahn. We agree with him and with others that America did not learn what it should have from September 11th. We're on the same page. But what about his hermeneutics? What about his involvement with nefarious figures whom you yourself know are nefarious? The kind of people you've always warned about. Which is it, Jan? Now, I'd be happy to meet with you, to talk with you, I'd meet with your board, I'd bring my board to meet your board, whatever you want. I'm not looking for a fight or a war, but I am looking for clarification because you're confusing people. I'm sorry to say these things, and I'm sorry if I hurt anyone that I didn't want to hurt. I like J.D. Farrick. Even though I've not met him, I like most of what he says, certainly. I like Jan Markell's ministry. I like most of what she said. I derive absolutely no joy, no joy in having made this clip. There's no joy in it for me. It is a very unfortunate necessity. I hope you can forgive me if you feel offended and that you can take the things I've stated in the spirit, the constructive spirit in which they are intended. May God bless Jan Markell and may God bless J.D. Farrick. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless.